Um, so in part one, we heard papers on the design of domestic spaces, and this session will be concerned with the design of domestic objects. As before, we're going to have all the papers and then a group Q&A session at the end. So please um, put any questions you have in the chat as we go. Um, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Zoe Hendon. Zoe is Head of Collections at the Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture at Middlesex University, and her research focuses on the factors which mean that certain kinds of material evidence are recorded in museums, whilst others are not, influencing what historians can say about the past. And today Zoe will be discussing rufflet tape as an innovation in domestic curtain making. Thanks, Alex, and hi everyone. Thanks for having me. So yeah, this afternoon I'm going to be talking about rufflet tape, which is a slightly more kind of quotidian product than we've heard about so far today. Uh, and I'll start by, oops, start by saying what exactly is rufflet tape? So rufflet tape was first produced in 1922 and was marketed to housewives as a new way to make and hang curtains. The tape came with draw cords and pockets for hooks, which could be sewn and the tape itself would be sewn to the top edge of each curtain. So removing the tedious job of sewing curtain hooks or rings on by hand. And this uh, idea of uh, a tape with pockets uh, was developed from gun cartridge technology after the First World War. So it was innovative. This is an example of what you would have done pre-rufflet tape. It was innovative because as you can see, pre-rufflet tape, you would, you would have had to sew every curtain hook on by hand, which was very fiddly and tedious. And rufflet tape did away with the need for this chore. So what did it mean for housewives? I'm saying housewives because that was the term used at the time, but one could say um, homemakers to be rather more gender neutral. So rufflet tape basically made it easier to change curtains each season or to take them down for laundering. It could be sewn onto curtains yourself, or you could specify it to your curtain maker when you're getting curtains made professionally. In other words, there were no barriers to participation in terms of skill. And it was advertised uh, widely, as I say, it was um, first invented in 1922. And from 1930, the company French and Son employed an advertising agency to, um, to advertise it. And I think it must have been around this time and on the, on the advice of that agency that they employed Grace Lovett Fraser to appear in adverts, which included instructions as to how to do it and reassurance as to how easy it was. And I should say that, so this um, interest in rufflet tape came to me because I'm interested in Grace Lovett Fraser as uh, a design advisor and um, authority on all things domestic in the interwar period. So this is part of a, a kind of larger project. So in 1934 and 1935, numerous adverts appeared in the British press, often in, in local papers under the auspices of local department stores. In this case, we're looking at one for Moore, uh, Moore and Collingham of Lincoln, but identical adverts appeared in other papers around the country at the same time. So the name of the local shop would just be inserted into the box at the bottom, but basically the rest of the advert was the same. So I'm showing you the whole page here just so you can get an overview, but now we're going to zoom in to see certain details. As you can see, the advert includes little drawings that are step-by-step -step instructions on how to so on your um, rufflet tape and therefore how, and then how to insert your hooks and how easy it was and making it very easy for the housewife to understand the point of all this. And uh, stressing that it reduces the tiresome details of curtain making to a few easy, easy operations. And I suppose the, the, the point of 
all of this was that you were being encouraged to have two sets of curtains or more than one set of curtains uh, and that you might swap them summer and winter, thus buying more, more product. In other words, in, uh, in, encouraging consumerism. And at the bottom of the page, two further bits of information for the potential rufflet tape purchaser. So it advertises a special demonstration of rufflet tapes and curtain making on May the 12th. So in other words, you're stepping from the pages of the paper into the actual department store itself. You could attend a demonstration to, to understand this new product, rufflet tape. How did it work? How would it make your life easier? And in addition, you could write off for a free booklet of curtain making hints authored or supposedly authored by Grace Lovett Fraser. And again, that would give you step-by-step -step instructions. So there's an awareness that consumers had to gain confidence in using this new product. So Rufflet as a company was very good at promoting itself. For example, this booklet, which explained how to use it, also linked Rufflet tape to the most fashionable and desirable home furnishings. So if we go to an inside page of the, this booklet, uh, and looking closely at that curtain on the left, we can see that that is a uh, curtain design by Jacqueline Groag for heels, from 1953. So in other words, they're promoting their product by linking it by association with some of the most desirable textiles designs of the time. In this case, as I say, heels of 1953, which would have been sort of reasonably expensive-ish. So why has Rufflet tape been overlooked by historians? I think there are kind of three main reasons. Firstly, Rufflet tape offered huge advantages to women because it was time saving, but it wasn't really sexy. It didn't require a huge outlay on new appliances or electricity or infrastructure. And also it's not one thing or a series of things that could become collectible like Pyrex or Tupperware. It's never gonna be a status object. No one's ever gonna say, oh, I'm a collector of Rufflet tape samples. That's never gonna happen. And also it's a product which is kind of adjacent to home craft, such as embroidery and knitting. But again, it's functional, so not very sexy for design historians. And I think that even for design historians, there's resistance to looking at things that our mothers and grandmothers thought was important. So for example, my grandmother swapped her curtains for winter and summer, and this was a big, big deal for her. And as a child, I could not have been less interested. I thought this was the most pathetic thing, <laughs> and pathetic thing to be interested in. But now I see that it was a really good example of the way in which she was shaping the domestic environment in a really tangible way. Another reason why it's been overlooked is that museums, uh, and, and I'm including Museum of Domestic Design and Architecture here, haven't always catalogued it properly. And so, for example, curators are generally more interested in curtains as examples of fabric design or social history than the methods used to hang them. So this example was acquired because of the design by Lucy and Day and the social history story attached to the person who bought these curtains. But in the catalogue, we didn't note the presence of rufflet tape on the catalog record until I went back and looked at it again in preparation for this talk. So uh, obviously rufflet tape was there, but I hadn't noticed it on the catalog. And thirdly, rufflet tape is almost so simple and so ubiquitous even now that design historians have overlooked it as an example of domestic innovation. Once invented, it has undergone very little in the way of further design innovation, 
except for perhaps getting a bit wider, so with extra rows of um, pockets. So in this very brief paper, I've described the development of Rufflet tape and the marketing strategies employed to promote it. I'm arguing that it's an example of innovative, innovative technology that has often been overlooked in design histories. But I did do think that it had a big part to play in shaping domestic labor and domestic environments throughout the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, our next speakers are Hao Yang Wang, a PhD candidate majoring in interior and furniture design at the Academy of Fine Arts and Design at Tsinghua University, and Yi Zhang, a PhD candidate at the Politecnico di Milano. Their paper today discusses ping feng folding screens as items of traditional Chinese furniture. Okay, fine. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to have this chance to give a speech about uh, Mr. Rail's traditional Chinese furniture, uh, pingfeng, uh, known as a folding screen. Uh, before the speech, I would like to introduce myself and my colleague Yi Zhang. And I'm a PhD student from the Academy of Fine Arts Tsinghua University, uh, China, and I also work as a researcher in the Institute of Furniture Design at Tsinghua University. Yi Zhang is a PhD student at Politecnico di Milano. Uh, she researches uh, sound, sound design and narrative in museums and uh, temporary exhibitions. Uh, I guess that not everyone here is familiar with what the screen is. Please look the uh, Chinese characters of pingfeng in the slides. The left is ping, translated into English, which means screen, shield. The right one is feng, which means wind together. They mean a screen that blocks the wind. Indeed, when the screen was initially created, it was an item of furniture used in interior spaces, usually placed around the bed to block the wind. Later, it was assigned the new application of space division. Set shielding and decoration and derived from various forms such as setting secrets, hanging secrets, and table secrets. Folding secrets has always maintained an uh, important status in ancient Chinese life. The first chronicle of Chinese history, the historical record, states the king stood at the folding screen and here he accepted the audience of the lords. It could show that the folding screen was um, an uh, um, indispensable uh, item of furniture in ancient Chinese life. Uh, not only is it um, a symbol of power and status, but it is also uh, regarded by the uh, literati as a valuable artifact that can show off their artistic tastes. However, uh, folding secret pingfeng is mainly made of wood, uh, which is fragile and delicate, and therefore fewer have survived. Uh, screens from different periods have different styles. During the Han Dynasty, people used folding screen mainly with baths and uh, painted with lacquer, which are distinguished by their decorative features. During the Eastern Jin Dynasty, house construction favored the uh, ventilation of the space, so folding screen were mainly used as barriers to block the wind during this period. And uh, their functionality uh, was more important than their decorative features. Uh, during uh, three and early Tang dynasty, uh, folding screen appeared in living spaces and merged with other furniture categories. The size of screen began to expand and the larger volume also fixed the screen's position in the space. Uh, during the, uh, the Song Dynasty, uh, the huge volume of folding screen and its role in 
redistributing and dividing, the interior space layout gradually increases. The modeling and the decorative expressiveness of the screen were also enhanced during this period. During the Ming and the Qing dynasty, folding screen were uh, functional and uh, beyond that, play a crucial role in decorating a space. The popularity of uh, practical locking techniques has resulted in uh, screens with acute details and shapes. After the introduction to the science of Chinese screens, I will present um, a special type of screen called Chongping. The left Chinese character uh, Chong uh, means repeating consistent and parallel. Repeating screen means that the screens in the real world are also uh, deep -sided with screens. The word repeating here, in this case, tries to describe the overlap between the real world screens and the parallel world screens in the um, cent uh, center paintings. The repeating screen has three layers of meaning. The first layer is furniture objects. The second layer is the medium of separation of special real world and the pictorial space. The, the third layer is graphic narrative and significance. The picture here uh, shows a classical piece of repeating screen it was produced in Shanxi province in China. The border structure of the repeating screen is, is um, a continuation of the traditional style of early China with open work carvings on the border rather than just mo motifs on the surface. The center of the repeating screen uh, deep uh, sets a uh, sense of uh, literati uh, party. So the picture, we can see two men laying their backs against the repeating screen to do their paintings. Well, uh, one man in front of them focused on the curiosities scattered on the floor. Two incense tables that carry incense burners were also set up on the repeating uh, screen and together with a vermilion uh, lacquer table behind the repeating screen, where uh, ancient swords and uh, porcelain were placed, they formed a virtual world that mapped to the real world. The bottom end of the repeating screen featured a scrolling uh, grass pattern, uh, while the rem remaining three sets featured a ge geometric pattern. In this, sick, uh, in this case, uh, the repeating screen can be seen as consisting of an internal word, uh, the screen painting, an uh, external word, the real word, and uh, screen structure. When the Asians stood in front of the screen and uh, admired it, the screen blocked the view, and the screen provided a place e exclusive to the vision where the viewer uh, became an experiencer of the inner world. The viewer is brought back to the reality of the external world when the screen structure blocks the view. Mo uh, moving from inside to uh, outside and back again leads the audience to constantly jump between reality and the parallel worlds emphasizing the illusion of the internal world and the, and the reality of the external world. The repeating screen becomes an intermediate medium that blurs the boundary between reality and illusion, that, thus uh, generating a dual waving uh, experience and provoking reflection. The ancient Chinese made their visions accessible by creating parallel words on repeating screen, this art from this art form um, seems to uh, be simply creation and imaginative uh, uh, lyricism, but it uh, implicitly reveals the uh, ancient 
contemplation of the universe and the world. Traditionally, screens or sitting screens are mostly set behind the seat in the special center or at the entrance to reflect the user's status. It serves three purposes. Uh, firstly, to block the veil. Secondly, as a furnishing item for the interior. And lastly, to divide space to four people to contemplate and prepare. Screens in living rooms protect the user's privacy and provide an implicit method that the user have a, a mountain or shell to lean on. In China, traditional screens are primarily preser preserved in museums. However, the modern paradigm of Chinese screen design is still active in contemporary furniture innovation. In the end, uh, we go back to modern times, modern screen design and innovation, continue and joy on traditional screens form and the construction language, which contain uh, identity and the status symbols that have gradually faded with the transformation of Chinese society. In contrast to traditional screens, which are con uh, constructed in a form that emphasizes uh, complexity and, and the luxury to demonstrate power, modern screens are minimalist and uh, led by to suit modern lifestyles and aesthetic trends. Thank you all for your attention and welcome to follow us on social media. If you have any question or are uh, interested in our research, please don't he hesitate to contact us online. Many thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so our next one is a pre-recorded um, talk by Andrea Bandoni, a Brazilian educator and designer whose research focuses on ecology. Um, she's currently working towards her PhD in design at Lisbon University, looking at biodesign in the Amazon region. So I will just uh, share my screen. Let me know if it's if it's working. Hello, yeah. my name is Andrea Bandoni. I'm a designer from Brazil. At the moment, I'm doing my PhD studies in Portugal at the University of Lisbon uh, with a support from the La Caixa Foundation. I'll talk about the, the Amazonian cuyas, which are a very common object in the Amazonian homes. The goal of this research was to understand cuyas under a design perspective with historical references uh, and also to understand the potential of cuyas for biodesign and ecological design practices. For the methods, I utilized um, literature review, participative observation of cuya artisans, interviews with artisans, a biologist and an anthropologist, and also visited museums and archives. The Amazonian cuyas, most of the time, they look like bows and are made from the fruit of a tree. They are sometimes confused with cords uh, because the final objects can look the same, but they come from different plants, which come from different places. Cuyas are native from Latin America. The use of cuyas is extremely versatile. They can serve various purposes, including food and drink containers, shovels, bags, um, cases, vases, and packaging. Here you can see it as a tool in the market uh, used for measuring shrimps. Then the cuya inside a boat, uh, ready to remove the water that enters the boat. And finally, as a bathing tool. The use of cuyas is deeply rooted in the Brazilian indigenous tradition. Uh, they have become an integral part of the indigenous imaginary and maintain their significance to this day. Cuyas are commonly sold as souvenirs, and here you can see ornamented cuyas. Some use the traditional technique of carving, and some are painted with local motifs. Cuyas also serve the main dish of the local para cuisine, which is takaka. Um, it is a sign of regional cultural identity, 
because you won't eat takaka if not in a koya. Uh, here is also a painting from the last century that depicts the act of selling this dish in the streets of the city, as it is still today in the cities in the streets of Belém, uh, one of the biggest cities in the Amazon. This is the Crescentia courgette tree, which where where the fruits come from. Uh, this tree is normally found close to riverbanks, and the conviviality of coyeras with humans dates back to 5,000 year, uh, years. And this plant was domesticated not because of its food qualities, as it is, it, it is typical in most plants, but because it has a symbolic, aesthetic, and utilitarian appeal. Biologists found out that the tree is present in these areas with black and white dots from Mexico to Brazil. As most of the communities utilize uh, the tree for domestic uses, uh, biologists call it a technological plant. The production techniques of the different communities have not been compared yet, and they are very different. So uh, the focus of my research is in this pink circle in communities close to the city of Santarém in, inside the Brazilian Amazon forest. As this biological study also shows, uh, the same species present individual trees that produce fruits with very different shapes and sizes, with their diameter ranging from 5 to 25 centimeters. Cuyas have captivated researchers and travelers for centuries. Uh, the naturalist Alexandre Rodrigues Ferreira, uh, his report Memories about Cuya from 1786 provides valuable insights into historical Cuya production, including many characteristics that even today document precisely their artisanal production. Ferreira stated that Cuyas are the plates, uh, the cups, and all the tableware used by the Indians. Here you can see side by side uh, a drawing about cuyas of around 150 years ago and the artisans working today. The indigenous practices are very preserved uh, and these artisans are riverine women from the Amazon area. Um, it is interesting to note that the craft of making tuyas, cuyas is passed down from mother to daughter, uh, making it a female dominated practice. In 2015, the way of making cuyas of the low Amazon, uh, which is this area I'm studying, was recognized as immaterial cultural patrimony of Brazil. This process involves harvesting uh, the mature cuya fruits, then cutting them half, removing the pulps and drying the skin and sending them. And finally, uh, coating the shells with layers of natural resin and then these painted cuyas uh, with the resin, they are placed in a bed of sand and ashes, sprinkled with human urine, uh, producing a black glossy layer that makes it more resistant. The ornamentation is then carved on this top layer with different patterns uh, that further enhance their appearance. Back to the historical study, in this research, queers collected in the 18th century were observed, and the ornamentation in many pieces is very intricate, and there's a clear reference to European patterns. Um, the, report, the report Memories about queers uh, describes the use of a wide range of natural organic pigments in the ornamentation of queers that are no longer in use today, and can only be observed in museum collections. A typology that is no longer produced also stands out. This is the cuya de gomos, uh, which was made by placing strings um, in a wooden base around the growing fruit. It is therefore a clear example of biofabrication made in the 18th century, the fruits being molded by humans to transform their appearance and generate new qualities in the object, such as stability and ornamentation. Uh, now I'll mention some of the conclusions of this study so far. The first is that design has a narrow perspective attached to an industrial paradigm. Um, um, no references to cuyas were found uh, in the design field, 
only in uh, anthropology and biology. So uh, we can understand that uh, indigenous objects are highly undervalued by designers, even in countries such as Brazil with a strong indigenous presence. Details related to the amount of materials or the duration of procedures, which are essential to design, they are not covered in the descriptions of the, of the, um, that come from other fields such as anthropology and were also not clarified by the artisans. So uh, design research is very much needed to learn the techniques. There is a huge disparity between industrialized objects and an object of the forest. Queers can be used for different activities. They overlap industrial categories of use. For example, they can serve as packaging, as kitchen utensil, or as a toy at the same time. Uh, they are produced through an artisanal process, which is clean uh, and circular, originally indigenous. Um, so they are sustainable objects still being used in the 21st century. The traditional practices can leverage sustainable design. Queer's result of a long partnership between women and plants. Their way of working shows a profound balance with the environment, with their tools uh, being organic and no waste, which is an alternative to contemporary industrial design and production. And finally, the ancestral potential of queers for innovation. So uh, as the study shows, there, there was this example of biofabrication from the 18th century. The painting of queers also suggests a connection between these materials and processes related to biodesign practices. And the presence of colors in cuyas uh, that are aged more than 200 years ago proves that the organic pigments are resistant and deserve investigation. Thank you very much. You know, again, well, if <laughs> um, did you send it to me, Ameline? Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, no, here oh, it goes. Good. Okay, fantastic. How adequate to come back from eternity with a presentation on the on the home and uh, and struggling with its uh, its professional technologies. Uh, hello, uh, so my name is Emin Bure. I'm a lecturer at the University of Sussex, uh, and this is um, a work in progress about uh, modern torture and uh, uh and how it has become well has become an untold norm in the us in particular uh of domestic lighting um it all started with just um me stumbling upon the uh upon the recall in 1997 uh of 40 million allergen torture lamps uh when the us only had 100 million households and I, re I just remember thinking like, how, how was this V1 lamp that nearly half of US households have? Now you've seen that lamp before, and it's definitely something that's uh, very common in Europe. Like it's tubular, it has a wide base, a weighted base, it either has a reflective bowl, reflective plate. Um, but still this seemed, uh, this just seemed out of, uh, range with what I would have expected, uh, and something um, something else that struck me is that whereas in U.S. catalog or uh, U.S. documentation, they are still referred to as door share. Uh, this is no longer the case as well in the world where they are uh, referred to as uplighters. Uh, and so one other thing that I was wondering is, okay, how did 
how did we go from a tall share to a modern tall share? And how did it become ubiquitous within that uh, context? Um, and as uh, what I found is that, again, um, uh, similarly to uh, the reflect uh, mentioned earlier, it's quite hard to find anything about the design. There are often, um, they are produced by companies, but they ne don't necessarily have an offer. Uh, they are, well, a disclaimed alpha. Um, there isn't a designer, more than like to share, there aren't necessarily like great examples in the history of design of that particular lamp. Therefore, there are uh, many designer to shares out there. Um, we, we like, I was also struggling with the differences in how it was named. Uh, and so these presentations are articulated around like several uh, corpuses. One is the uh, newspaper ads. Uh, the other is I focused on uh, patents and uh, all of the discourses around the recall. I looked for a European uh, comparison to the uh, IKEA catalog, since this is one of the best seller I liked in product at IKEA today. Um, and uh, later to explain how it became a norm, I was, I've been looking into interior design advice and residential lighting norms and how they might explain to us why this became so popular. Uh, so just as a, just for context, so this is a historical tow share. Uh, tow share can be anything, it should be self-standing. It should have a source of light that is directed towards the ceiling. Uh, it could be used with gas, could be used with, uh, uh, with oil. The um, uh, the newspaper copies uh, start I, like advertising for Toshi around 1920, which is quite consistent with electrification, and you can see the variety of um, uh, of forms available around that time. Um, and on the right is the modern Toshi floor lamp, so still sold under the name Toshi uh, today, and the same design or something very similar is available through many different brands. Uh, and again, rarely associated with any um, designer's name. Um, what was uh, what I found interesting is that, so in the 1920s and 1930s, when you start seeing the expression modern tall share uh, appear, it's not necessarily about the shape, it's more to differentiate them from antique. So until the 1930s, uh, we're well, well, mostly seeing advertising for Italian antique, Italian tow share, and then from 1930 and on, um, tow shares are being advertised uh, for this kind of shape that you can see uh, on the right. Uh, the bow is still decorated, but usually the, the tube has been paired on. Some example from um, streamlined the streamlined movement, streamlined design are even more so uh, simplified. Similarly, examples in the UKs around the, the, the same time uh, show a name that is very, uh, that is very similar to, um, uh, to what we have today. Just a tube, a bowl, a base, nothing more. You do see uh, on the Evening Stars um, ads uh, on the left, uh, how the designs are characterized. Uh, they all have the same structure, but depending on the decor of the bowl, that is what distinguishes the modern from the classic tall shear uh, around that time. And um, um, yeah, um, and um, Uh, and it's it's a probably that just exists in lots of different variations, um, um, in lots of different small variations, but essentially always have the same form factor. Uh, that say you see um, uh, again like that term modern is associated with many uh, different uh, different approaches to the design of that board in particular. So for instance. 
uh, the, uh, this one is described as having a modern influence. Apple were losing the simplicity of previous models uh, and were now in the 1950s. Uh, and this continues uh, until the 19, uh, 1970s with models that are ever, uh, with both that are ever skinnier and both that are ever uh, more simplified. And then in the 1980s, uh, the allosion uh, torture is, uh, is brought to the uh, United States. Um, and, uh, and today, this is what you will find if you're searching for a uh, so-called like simple torture. Uh, so this, uh, I thought there are some variations and we'll come back to the question of a tree torture in a little bit. Uh, they're all, they have all been paired on of any decorations. They usually can be folded uh, and packed uh, in a very, very small space. This is one of my own, uh, and I have no recall of where, where, this, where this one comes from, just like to illustrate just how common of an object and how uh, standard of an object design uh, this has become. Um, so what's uh, with the 1980 allusion torture uh, is when uh, the torture becomes like ubiquitous because it can be used to uh, light a whole room at once. Um, and there's, uh, um, and this was probably why, it's, uh, why so many uh, uh, units were sold and needed to be recalled when, um, uh, when the consumer protection um, officials realized that they could easily cause fires. Um, we, and while there is no uh, patent whatsoever for the shape of the of this simple or modern door share, um, in the 1990s, with the rise uh, of a door share as a consumer product due to the use of halogen, uh, there is some innovation around the shape, and particularly, uh, this is, um, uh, so this was, uh, uh, yeah, um, particularly the use of a tree door share. So we've added uh, added uh, lights on the body of a door share to be used as reading lights, for instance. Um, uh, and these are the only door share that mention a designer, like because the designer has been associated, well, an inventor, because it was associated with their tent. Uh, Alpha, when you find current like products that are um, uh, that are sold with that same design, no designer is ever mentioned. Comparing to Europe, uh, the first the first appearance of a door share in the IKEA catalog, which is just a good way of uh, since it's associated with modernist design and, and like simplified design and cheap design as well. It's a good way to compare uh, the, uh, the US and the European um, context. Uh, the first appearance of uplighters in their uh, in the catalog is in 1983. Um, and they uh, it's not quite the same design that they are now known for. Um, they did develop a range of design in the, in the mid 1990s uh, where the uh, when the uplighter was at the height of its fame, uh, including the color design. Uh, it's almost always their cheapest lighting design, Afro, um, more design only variation or more original variations uh, could be sold uh, at higher prices. And so when I like when I got there, I just thought, okay, so this is a lamp that uh, can be very cheap to produce. Uh, it has it has a design only feel. Uh, it's just like it is a uh, more, maybe more uh, than a traditional lampshade, uh, and that is probably why this became so ubiquitous. Um, and uh, um, and I was looking at. At more of the uh, interior design advice literature and how people are talking about door share, and they similarly mention like yes, it can. Uh, it can, this is the only type of lighting that can light the whole room, which finally made me realize that this is not this 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 the problem is not the same everywhere. 
um, I'm from France. France has uh, uh, regulations in housing mandating that there should be at least one point of uh, under ceiling for lights in every room. Uh, and there is no such thing in housing regulations, uh, as there's just no such thing in housing regulations in the US. Um, and there are some, uh, there are some um, guidelines, rules about the type of luminous that should be used, if there are permanent luminous, uh, but simply like people uh, need to add their own. And this is probably the solution that is not just the cheapest, but also the um, the most practical regardless of a space. And I think this is a very good example of, of like the um, how a product uh, becomes modern and uh, how little uh, aesthetic choice we have in uh, in housing uh, when gnomes aren't supporting the very uh, basic needs um, uh, for uh, activities in the home. Um, and just like all of the uh, forces that shape this type of largely uh, invisible innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for your presentation and also for persisting with technology, which always seems to let us down at some point. <laughs> Um, so uh, moving on, our final paper of the day will be given by uh, Sinin Goluku, a designer, researcher and educator whose work is situated at the intersections of technology, social justice, urbanism, design, data science, artificial intelligence and civic engagement through an intersectional feminist lens. And today's paper will look at gender, craft and trade, a sociocultural exploration of home-based maker machines. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot, and I will be starting. Um, yes, so I am Sinem, um, and I will be presenting a work in progress, actually, Gender, Craft and Trade, a Social Cultural Exploration of Home-Based Maker Machines. And this research is part of a longer term project called Domestic Futures, where we explore the innovation in the domestic space uh, through a feminist futures lens. And uh, it will be a small, but not boring, hopefully, tour around gender, craft, and trade today. So craft coming from the Middle English word for strength or skill derived from an old English word craft, which comes from an old high German uh, craft for strength and, uh, and means um, skill in planning, making, and executing. Crafting is truly one of the oldest actions that is the that the humanity has been performing, and the earliest known examples of handmade crafts date back to the Stone Age. And these objects served both practical and decorative purposes and were an essential part of the early human life. And crafts in the ancient world were as diverse as the cultures that produced them, both in their function and manufacturing process. And craft is defined as a handmade product that requires skill, tradition, a relationship to materials and a hard manual labor. It is characterized as practice based combining applied skills for both artistic and practical purposes. And crafting also involves the development of new ideas and products, has positive effects on mental health, and often involves experimentation. And craft making has a rich history uh, across various cultures and contexts. However, this research is tailored to reflect global North perspectives and UK specific experiences within a short span of time where the craft making culture today has been pretty much shaped by the advances of modern world, starting from industrial revolutions, continuing with arts and crafts and being transformed through the digital revolution right now. And of course, there's a gendered history behind this whole period as well. Um, and although along with the third wave of uh, feminism destruction, uh, crafts movements and domestic mastery of women got recognized and valued for their creativity, the stereotypically gendered division of spaces, skills and interests still shaping the discourse in this field. And as men are historically associated with the public sphere, while women are associated with the private or domestic spheres by the patriarchal stereotypes, as a result, Domestic craft production, which is actually what we are focusing today, has been often approached as a feminine activity and much often standing as an ignored or underseen practices of production. And this image here is a photo of a group of women in the UK knitting socks, 
um, for, for the soldiers in the second, um, during the Second World War. And these vigils actually are just after the same war, a, a small newspaper manual for woodwork from 1956 and an advertisement poster of a self-installing floor tile, um, encouraging women to install their own tiles, both from the same era. The era of the post-war do-it-yourself boom. During the World War II, as people with handy skills were employed for the war effort, leaving the shortage of their parents at home, to address these organizations such as the YWCA provided classes to teach basic home repair and maintenance to women. And originating in the US and spreading to Europe as well, the so-called do-it-yourself boom was a result of a variety of factors. Increased rates of home ownership, rising labor costs, and more free time were um, some of the commonly mentioned reasons. And some proposed that the mend and make do mentality from the depression and the World War II or the mechanical skills gained during wartime contributed to this trend. Uh, the do-it-yourself movement of the 50s set the stage for a more democratized approach to craft work, where the skills and knowledge required uh, to create uh, were shared more widely among the populace. And this shift played a crucial role in challenging the traditionally gendered division of labor by providing avenues for women and other marginalized groups to engage in craft work and, and do-it-yourself activities thus breaking down some of the gender barriers associated with craft production and, and domestic work. While, woman, uh, while women's domestic craft production has been uh, dismissed and seen as non-necessary for decades, journeying back to the Victorian era, we find the origins of the arts and crafts movement initiated by women. During this time, women were the original do-it-yourselfers when it came to home decoration, and many decorative products were crafted by them. Before do-it-yourself was a thing, actually, women were do-it-yourselfing, and they are do-it-yourselfing more than ever right now. Today, it is not as widely recognized yet, but we are going through another do-it-yourself boom, and what drove us here and how is it happening is totally different and very much shaped by the digitalization and automation, which is initiated by the digital revolution. Laser cutters, CNC machines, 3D printers, cutting plotters, open source repositories, they're all shaping how we are crafting today. But why is it happening now? With the rise of digital platforms, as, as I mentioned, and automation technologies, we are seeing a shift towards smaller, more flexible and distributed production processes. This means that businesses are able to respond more quickly to changing market demands and customer preferences. At the same time, the increasing availability of free time due to the automation that is taking over some of our daily labor activities is also changing the way we work and consume. And with more leisure time, we are able to pursue our interests, leading to a greater demand for niche and custom products. Digit digitization of marketing and sales has also re revolutionized the way businesses reach and engage with their customers. With social media, especially, um, and email marketing and other digital channels, businesses are able to connect with customers in real time and provide personalized experiences. While these transformations have been ongoing for a while now, in 2020, um, started with a searing some face masks, it ended up as a COVID DIY boom. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced many people to spend more time at home and with people unable to go out and socialize as much as they used to do, people slowly turned into do-it-yourself projects as a way to pass the time and, and stay productive. Additionally, the pandemic has caused many people to experience financial difficulties, um, leading them to take on do-it-yourself projects instead of paying for, for professional services. The rise of social media has also played a significant role in, the, in this boom, and um, people are inspired by the creative ideas they see online uh, and are more confident in their ability to craft themselves nowadays. Moreover, during the pandemic, people began supporting small businesses within their communities or, or online spheres by um, making purchases from them as well, and that also contributed to the market. In that period, both uh, material suppliers and craft e-commerce pl platforms um, experienced a record level interest. In parallel to this, UK, UK has been experiencing a recognizable peak in both production and consumption of craft products as well. And looking into stats, we see this more clearly, where UK-wide craft sales skyrocket along with craft buyers and online purchases as well, making craft a mainstream industry again. When it comes to the crafters themselves, we see an increasing and promising interest both uh, from historically marginalized groups uh, like um, 
marginalized groups from economic inclusion, I mean, uh, like women and disabled individuals. And women now are making up to 75% of the crafters in the UK. Uh, and in addition to that, we also see that more and more women are getting into crafts industry to be self-employed. And this interest to craft industry from the women involves uh, a new and interesting group, mompreneurs. And some research like Michelle and Nets show that a big portion, around 69% of the craft entrepreneur subjects are consisted of mompreneurs who are operating their businesses along with their childcare responsibilities right now. The emergence of mompreneur manufacturing is largely made possible by homemade, home-based um, maker machines. And online design repositories tracing functions are found in plotting software to create professional designs and goods uh, without any te technical or design training. Plotters to be used at home without the need for a special room. Ability to purchase and sell products in local Facebook groups or without, without the need um, to create an online store or website. And ease of product uh, photo shooting via mobile phones and ease of self-marketing through social media challenge channels. These tools are giving mothers uh, right now who are taking care of the, the care work, um, giving mothers ability to work and generate income while carrying um, their um, domestic um, care work, work duties. Therefore, all four main processes is today happening online, designing, producing, marketing, and selling in the domestic craft production. And talking of selling online, one of the main venues for, for um, the entrepreneurs at uh, Etsy, statistics shows us the sudden and concentrated interest that emerged in 2020 and early 2021 as well. And, and it is showing that 81% of Etsy sellers in the UK um, are actually women. Um, and you can also under, you can also see um, how how much the, the numbers changed between uh, 2019 and 2020 to understand how COVID really initiated this boom. And when we look at the maker groups among UK, we see that many businesses actually grow organically out of domestic crafting pra practices, starting as an occasional or emerging ma maker where most of the production happens within the domestic spaces. But what are these home-based maker machines or, or personal fabrication machines? Home-based maker machines, including um, cutting plotters, 3D printers, CNC machines, engravers, heat press, and similar devices have revolutionized the possibilities of personal fabrication and crafting, enabling individuals to transform digital designs into physical realities within the confines of their own home. Cutting plotters machines, which are called by the name of the most popular brand, Cricut, for example, have opened up a world of possibilities for crafters, allowing them to pre precisely cut a myriad of materials with a simple uh, or intricate designs, while 3D printers have turned digital 3D models into tangible objects, promoting innovations in various fields from prototyping to personalized um, manufacturing. These devices embody a democratization of manufacturing technologies, allowing everyday people, hobbyists, moms, and small-scale entrepreneurs alike to design, create, and innovate in unprecedented ways um, and with a diverse range of applications from custom home decor and personalized gifts to creating prototypes and, and functional products. While home-based maker machines can include a variety of different technologies, as I mentioned, uh, today with the ongoing interest over Web um, 2.0, like a social media or user-generated user content, when we talk of small biz machines, it tends to connotate a narrower set of devices that are used on a desktop, allowing users to download pre-made designs from an online store uh, or, or prepare through a very easy to use software that comes with the device itself with not much design or technical knowledge. And these machines range from the ones that cut out the materials like a paper, plastic, fat, leather, films, uh, to the ones that print on these, uh, to print on these blank goods, and and some more others that cannot be that can be used by entrepreneurs to create unique custom products in no time. And talking of such a woman-dominated creative field, it is inevitable to observe how the um, gendered aesthetics operate within this creativity and production space. And it is of course not a new topic in the design his history. 
and gendered associations um, to design pro products are not always added by user after the product is made, but designer themselves, designers themselves can uh, make gendered assumptions um, about the user, which can be built into the final product. Cockburn and Omra's research on the microwave has been a great example of this. The microwave was initially marketed as a brown good for single men who were assumed to be more interested and knowledgeable about hi-fi equipment than, than, than cooking. And later it was redesigned as a white good marketed to family households where women were assumed to do most of the cooking. And this creates a mutual shaping of gender um, and technology where features designed for women or men um, tend to reflect and reinforce gender stereotypes, um, which in turn affects design choices. And taking the Game Boy example, which is my favorite, uh, which was initially produced in grey to be marketed for boys uh, and was then produced in pink when Nintendo noticed that there were actually a big crowd of girl and woman gamers and they were still stuck with the same old brown and white approach uh, so they were aiming to approach those girls by by designing it um, in pink um, and every new technology opens up a renegotiation of a power and gender relations, I believe. And talking of such a woman-dominated creative field, it is inevitable to observe, as I said, and criticize how the gendered aesthetics operate within this creativity. And here we will do this over two home-based maker machines, 3D printers and cutting plotters, which are often called by the brand name Cricut, as I mentioned. And both machines and technologies actually gained attention in the similar timeline, um, mostly becoming popular in the early 2010s and getting widespread um, in the last 10 years and used for mostly home-based, smaller scale production. While most 3D printers in the market tend to expose all their cables, materials, motors, and making the working mechanisms visible, they're often colored dark, matching with some vibrant colors like oranges and greens, adopting a techy and nerdy gamer aesthetics, highlighting its functionality and, and meshing capabilities. But when we look at the cutting plotters, which operates in, in two dimensions, um, unlike the 3D printers, we cannot really observe anything technical or technological um, about the machine, even in the, the two, two um, dimensions. Um, and as a user from outside, we cannot observe any of these. They almost stand as soft technology products rather than a hard one, and often offering a wide variety of cluster color options um, with curved corners uh, in contrast to most 3D printers, sharp corners and endpoints. This research does not focus on a particular device um, model or brand, but aims to analyze um, most common features presented in these two machine types as two selected cases. And, and I believe 3D printers are an outstanding one, while not only considering how it is being marketed and designed, but also um, by the means who is it designed by, especially considering that it is a highly male dominated industry with only 13% of workers in additive manufacturing, manufacturing industry um, are women. While the aesthetic tendencies I mentioned are traceable within the cultures um, that emerge around these production machines, and talking of democratization of the power and ability of production, literacy is one of the most important of these. And knowledge regarding these automated maker machines often gets shared and distributed within online spaces um, via, via a variety of channels diverging from community forums to Facebook groups, Instagram to Pinterest, newsletters to YouTube videos, and the knowledge is spread by the existing members of these communities and existing users of these technologies, carrying biases of the creators and about the carrying biases about the audience. From level of expertise to interest, graphic and aesthetic appearance to language use, it is full of um, these biases. Therefore, when we take um, cheat sheets as a case, uh, among all the uh, other educational material, the distinct differences between the two content collections. And while cutting plotter cheat and info sheets are way easier to consume, rich in visuals designed with pastel colors and with more intimate language, we, we also observe that the 3D printing um, cheat sheets and information sheets um, showcase distinctly different features with a more technical wash 
and with a higher level of technical language. These di distinctions um, are observable for the spaces that these technologies used in as well when it comes to workstations. While spaces of additive manufacturing reflect high level complex functionality and technological performance, reproducing the machine's gamer aesthetics again, on the other hand, the cutting culture workstation aesthetics that is crowdsourced through user generated online content, um, we come across a less compact and much more modular environment that showcase lighter color tones in a neat order. These spatial arrangements. Sorry, Sin, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we're a bit over time, so um, about one minute it's left. It's just two slides. Right, okay. Thanks. Uh, these spatial arrangements extend, extends beyond the domestic space and manifests itself in the shared making spaces as well, through maker spaces, fab labs, shared studios, and even hobby cafes. Um, theory on homosocial reproduction raises the issue that people are more likely to be part of uh, or find their way into social environments if people that are already part of the environment are similar to their own. And research shows that this is the case for making crafting spaces as well. And often one of the main reasons preventing people from joining Neve making spaces. And if you use or at least observe TikTok like I do, you would have maybe noticed um, the best date idea or the candle making experience or make your own ring in this cafe video um, video diary genres um, that has been taking over the TikTok um, recently. And there are more and more making experiencing shops appearing here and there every day in the, in the urban space, from carpet tufting to ceramic painting, phone case ornamenting to jewelry making. And these are places where people can pay a small amount of money to have access to the commercially designed studio spaces and materials, and often along with drinks and food even, and acknowledging rapidly increasing interest in craft making in the last couple of years, I believe the craft cafes or any other experience that merges craft making with another experience will be becoming more and more common. However, how these currently woman dominated spaces will transform with the digital and automated crafting tools is still a question in the air. Thank you.